Hello! In this tutorial, we are going to be creating this Pong game. And since Pong is a fairly simple game, this isn't going to be too difficult. So if this is your first game in Godot, or your first game in general, this tutorial should be quite easy to follow. But if you're looking for specific things, here are all the steps I will be going through. And if you already know some Godot, it's probably safe to start in this stage. And if you happen to like this tutorial, check out my Python game development course. In there, you'll be learning much more sophisticated games in Python and Godot, including a first-person shooter. But with all of that covered, let's talk about Godot. So what is Godot? Well, Godot is a game engine. And all that really means is that Godot is a program that helps you make video games. So when you make your game in Godot, you see immediately how your game would look like and you can drag and drop elements on the screen and see changes instantly. Which is a much better way to create video games than just looking at hundreds of lines of code. And Godot is by no means the only video game engine. There are loads of alternatives. But the one thing special about Godot is that it uses GDScript, which is essentially Python. So if you know Python and you want to make video games, then Godot is the best option by far. But to use it, we first have to install it, which is actually super easy. All you have to do is to go to godotengine.org, then go to download, and then download the version of Godot that is appropriate for your operating system. In my case, that's Windows. And once you finish the download and unzip the file, you should see a folder like this. And in there, all you have to do is click on Godot, and then you can see the project manager. And in here, you could either open an existing project or create a new project. In this case, it's empty because we haven't created any projects yet. But to do that, we have to click on new project, and then Godot is asking us for a name and a project path. In my case, I'm going to call this file Pong. I already have a file path that I can paste in right now. And Godot needs to have an empty folder, so this is what I'm going to create here. And then we have a few more options for the renderer, but this one is not going to matter for this tutorial. So I leave it to the default option. But that is all we needed. So now we can click on create and edit. And then we are getting into our game. So with that, let's talk about how Godot works. All right, now that we have our basic project, here's what we can see. And there are quite a few elements on the screen right now, and I am going to explain them when we get to them. But for now, don't worry too much about them. And before we are getting into anything in Godot, I would really like to start explaining how Godot works on a more fundamental level, because that is really going to help us understand later on what we are doing. So, Godot relies on two fundamental concepts to function. The first one is called nodes, and nodes are the really basic building blocks that actually create your game. So for example, a node could be a picture, a node could be a timer, a node could also be a 3D object, it could be lots of different things. Godot has a few hundred of them, and they effectively create your game. So when you see, for example, a player character, this one would be created out of different nodes coming together. For example, one node would be the picture, another node would be the physics calculation, another node might be a skeleton animation. But what you essentially do in Godot is that you put different nodes together and move them around on the screen, and that creates your game. And that's really it. You have a couple of nodes on the screen and you can influence the attributes and via that you can move them around. And that's really all you need to create a game. They can do quite a few more things like communicate with each other or have specific code. But what you really have to understand is that nodes create your game. They are the most fundamental concept in Godot and what we are going to work with the most by far. But here's one problem. By default, nodes are not visible which is kind of a problem for a video game. So we need a second concept. And that second concept is called a scene. And scenes in Godot serve two purposes. Number one is that they are a canvas for your nodes. So what you effectively do with your nodes is that you put them on a canvas and what the player later on perceives as a game is the scene with all the nodes in it. So a scene basically displays your game. And besides that, scenes are also really powerful to organize your game. And the reason for that is that we really easily end up with quite a few different nodes to organize our game. So if you have any even slightly more complex game, you will end up with hundreds of different nodes, which by itself would get really unwieldy and complex to work with. So instead what we can do is have different parts of our game as individual scenes. So for example, a player could be its own scene, and then you put this player scene into the level scene. 
And via that, you can work on each of these elements independently and focus on one specific thing. And with that, your game remains much more modular and much easier to work with. And that's basically it. If you understand these two concepts, you already have a really good starting point for Godot. So let's actually have a look at how this works in practice. So here we are back in our Godot editor. And what we can see right in the middle of the screen is called the viewport. And this viewport shows our open scene right now. And what we have at the moment is a 3D scene. And if you hold the middle mouse button in here and move the mouse around, you can move around in space. And if you look at the top of this window, you can see a tab. Right now it says empty. And you could save it and give it a name and you could save all the notes you want in there. But we don't want a 3D scene right now because our game is 2D. And to change between a 2D and a 3D scene, you have to look all the way at the top. And there you can see 3D and 2D. And if you just click on 2D, now we can see a 2D workspace. And in here, you can see this blue rectangle. And this is the actual size of our game. So if you want to put anything on the screen, it has to be inside of this blue rectangle for the player to see it. So this is really important. So this would be a very basic thing to look at the different scenes in your game. And if you want to create a new scene, you just click on the plus icon and then you would have a new scene. And you can create more, it's really up to you. But right now I only want to keep this one scene and I want to keep it in 2D. So now we have a scene, but obviously you can't really see anything on the scene right now. And to actually display something, we need a node. And to get nodes, you have to look at the top left of the screen. And there you can see what's called a scene tree. And right now we can choose different nodes. We can choose a 2D scene, a 3D scene, a user interface, or another node. And if you click on other node, you can see a fairly long list. Let me open up all the different subfolders. These are all the different nodes that you can have in Godot. And here you see lots of different things. For example, you have a skeleton, you have a visibility notifier, you have a touchscreen button, you have a polygon 2D, you have particles, and you have something called a sprite. And a sprite is what I'm going to start with for now. And this is really just a picture. And you might be asking right now, there are so many different nodes in here, how do you find anything? And for that, you use the search function. And in here, you can just type sprite, and there you get the sprite node that you want. And it will take you some time to learn about all the different nodes, but once you get even a little bit of practice, this will come very natural to you. But okay, so with the sprite selected, I click on create. And now we can see in our scene tree that we have a sprite node. But in the viewport, we can only see this red cross here. So how do we add a picture to this node? And for that, you have to look all the way to the right and there we have the inspector. And in the inspector, you can set the attributes of this node. And right at the top, we have what's called a texture attribute. And if you hover over it, Godot gives you a description of this property. And it says texture object to draw. And what this one effectively does is it takes a file of a picture and it displays it. So now what we need is a picture. And we do have that. If you look in the bottom left, there we have a file system. And by default, every Godot project always has one default file that's called icon.png, which is the Godot logo. And all you really have to do is to drag and drop this icon into the texture slot. And you can already see when you drag the file, there's this blue line around the file. So let me drop it in. And now we can see our picture. So this one looks quite well. And if I zoom out a bit, we can also move this picture around and place it wherever we want to have it on the screen. And let me put it roughly in the middle. So this would be one attribute of the sprite node. You could also look under transform. There you can see position, rotation and scale. So in here you could for example rotate this image or you could scale it up in different axes. Which I don't want to do right now. But this is really what you have to understand for Godot that what you effectively do is you take different nodes and you affect their properties. And this can be done either by using the inspector or it could be done in code, which is what we are going to see in just a little bit. But for now, let me save the scene. And to save a scene, you can either press Ctrl or Command S 
or go to scene and save scene. And if I click on it, we can see the folder again we created earlier. And in here, I want to create a new folder that I call player. Let me just spell it correctly. And now in this folder, I want to save the scene also with the name player. And Godot scenes are always saved with the file ending tscn, which I guess is short for scene. Um, no idea, but it doesn't really matter. So click on save. And now at the top of our scene, we can see player. And what we can do now is actually run the scene and see how our game would look like. And to do that, you have to look all the way at the top right. And there we can see play, we can see play scene, and we can see play custom scene. What really matters for now is play scene or F6. And let me click on it, then go to loads for a bit, and here we can see our game. Or, well, not really a game, but the picture. And you can't do anything right now, but you can see your game. And if we add a bit more code, this could be interactive. So we could have user input here, we could have enemies in here, we could have a moving ball in here. This works just like a game. But for now, let me close it. So this is really the most fundamental concept in Godot, that you work with scenes and with nodes. There's one more concept I do want to cover before we are getting into the actual player character. And that is that in the scene tree, the nodes are always in relation to each other. And let me illustrate what this means. So with the sprite selected, I want to add another node to this that is also going to be a picture. And to add another node, you have to go either click on this plus icon or press Ctrl A. And let me add another sprite node, so we have another picture. And what you can see right now is that we have one sprite at the root of our scene tree and another sprite connected to it. And what this means is that this sprite is a child of this node. And they're usually called parent node and child nodes. And this has direct implications for your game. And let me actually add an image to this second sprite node. So again, I just drag and drop this icon in there. And we can't see any change right now because the images are on top of each other. So let me move this image a bit to the side. So we can see our sprite node selected here, the one to the bottom right, and our parent node, the one right in the middle. Now, here's the really important thing. If we make any changes to the parent node, we are also going to affect the child node. However, when we move the child node, we are not going to affect the parent node. And let me demonstrate what this specifically means. So with the parent node selected, I just move it around. And while we're doing that, we also move the child node. And this would also apply if I go back to transform, if I rotated it, it would also rotate the child node. And if I scaled it, same thing, Whatever we do to the parent node, we are also going to do to the child node. And this is going to become really important to create our player character in a little bit, because we want to have one node that controls the entire player character, and all the other nodes on the player character always move in the same direction as this node that actually controls the player. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I think we have made some good progress for now, so let's actually start talking about our player character. So let's talk about creating a player character, which in our case is going to be a paddle that has a couple of functionalities. And let me go through what we want our player paddle to be able to do. The first and most important thing is that we have to be able to see it. So there has to be some kind of picture on our paddle. And this one should be straightforward. If you can't see your player character, you don't really have a player character. Number two is that we have to be able to control this player character. So if you're pressing a button on our keyboard, this thing is actually moving. So this is another really important thing. And besides that, our player character also needs to have the ability to react to physics. And this is actually a really important part, that we want a ball to bounce off this player character later on. And this is a physics calculation. And this is going to require a specific node in Godot that can actually work with physics. And in total, Godot has four different nodes that can work directly with physics, at least in 2D space. And these are called Kinematic Body 2D, Rigid Body 2D, Static Body 2D, and Area 2D. And they all work with physics in slightly different ways. And I'm going to go through all of them bar one in this tutorial. 
so I will explain every single one of them when we get to it. But for now, the one we are going to work with is called the Kinematic Body 2D, which is the most powerful kind of physics body in Godot. And this one is usually the node used for a player character, because this one can influence other physics bodies, and it can also be influenced itself by other physical bodies, and we can move it in code. So this one is really powerful and really useful for us. And this node is actually going to be the foundation of our player character. But there's one problem that's going to sound a bit weird. That the kinematic body by itself doesn't have a physical body. And this is going to need another node that's called a collision shape. And think of it like this. A kinematic body 2D by itself is essentially an atom in space. It can be influenced by physics, but it's so small you can't see it. And it's also so small that it can't really collide with anything. So we have to give it a physical shape, which is an entirely new node. But this is basically all we're going to use for our player. So let's actually implement all of this. So here I'm back in my player scene. And what I want to start with is to get rid of some nodes. So this child sprite node I don't need, so I'm going to delete it. So deleting it, you can either go to right click and delete node or press on delete. And then Godot is going to double check and I do want to delete it. Now our sprite node, I don't want to get rid of, I want to change it, which you can also do. And all you need to do is to right click on the node and change type. And then Godot brings us back to the menu and here we can choose a different node. And what I want to start with is called a kinematic body 2D. And do be aware, it has to be a 2D one. There's also a kinematic body this one is three-dimensional, so make sure to not use that one. We want a kinematic body 2D. And a really easy way to tell between 2D and 3D nodes is that 2D nodes are always blue, 3D nodes are always red. So that makes it kind of easy. But okay, we want a kinematic body 2D. And if you double click on this, you can also rename it. So I want to rename mine to player. And here already, Godot is giving us a warning that this node has no shape, so it can't collide or interact with other objects. Consider adding a collision shape 2D or a collision polygon 2D as a child to define its shape. And let's do that. So I click on the plus icon again, and let me get rid of this. And I want to add a collision shape 2D. And you could also use a collision polygon. We are going to see this one later. It works in very similar ways. But for now, I'm going to use a collision shape 2D. So I click on create. And now we have our player parent node and a collision shape 2D as its child node. And here we get another warning that a shape must be provided for the collision shape 2D to function. And to give it a shape, you have to look back into the inspector and there we can see shape. And there we have a drop down menu. And here we can select a couple of different shapes. And this is going to be the physical body of your player character. So you want to select a shape that resembles the player's shape as closely as possible. Which in my case, I think is going to be a rectangle shape 2D. Which is, well, a rectangle. And once you have clicked on that, you can see this bluish icon with a couple of red dots. And these red dots, you can use to change the scaling of this rectangle. And let me zoom out again. So what we want is to resemble our player shape, which is going to be a pedal somewhat reasonably well, which is going to look something like this. And this will be the shape that the ball is actually colliding with later on. And what I also want to do is that right now our player pedal is in the middle of the screen because I moved the sprite there earlier. And I want to change this back to zero and zero. And for that, I want to the inspector to transform. And here we have the position. You can either type in 0, 0 in here, or you could just use this icon, and then we go back to position 0 and 0. And, okay, I can close this again. And now we have the collision shape for our player. But let me save this scene now. If I were to run this game now, by pressing F6 again, or the icon, we can't see anything. Because a collision shape is invisible to the player which makes sense, you don't want to see the actual collision box that the player has around itself. So we have to give an actual image to our player. And the problem for that right now is that in our file system, we only have the default Godot icon, which, well, doesn't really work for us. So we have to import a couple of images, and that is super easy to do in Godot. 
And all you have to do, let me open my file. So this Pong folder is the Pong folder we used earlier to create our game. And above that, I have an assets folder. And all I have to do is to drag this assets folder into the Pong file and then go back to Godot. And then it loads for a bit. And now we have an assets folder. And in the assets folder, we have a ball, a paddle, a couple of sounds and a font. So how our text would look like. So these are all the things we need for our game. It's actually very simple. So let me close this folder again. And I'm not going to use the icon PAG anymore. So I'm going to delete it. And to delete it, I right click on it and click on delete. And then Godot is going to remove the file from the project. And can't be restored and I'm fine with that. So okay, now our game looks a bit cleaner. And with that, let's actually add the image to our player. And if you want to challenge yourself for this tutorial, now try to add the picture yourself to this player node. So you could just pause the video now and try to do this yourself and continue after you're done. And I would really recommend this, it helps you to learn so much. But let's do it together. So with the player selected, I'm going to click on the icon again and I'm going to add a sprite. And you can also see our sprite node in the recent tab. So I click on create and now we have a sprite. And I just need to drag and drop the image of the pedal into it. So I drag and drop the pedal into it. And now we can see our pedal or the image of our pedal. But there's one obvious problem right now that the shape of the pedal and the image of the pedal have different sizes. So we have to resize the pedal a little bit to properly be above the pedal image. And there's one thing you also have to realize, that in the node tree, the order really matters. So right now, the collision shape 2D is below the sprite. And this you can also see in the viewport. And let me reverse the order by just dragging it below. Now, our sprite or the image is below the collision shape. And this kind of thing is becoming important later on quite a bit, where you want to control what elements are on top of each other. So always be aware, if something is further down in the scene tree, it's usually above the other nodes in the actual viewport. But in here, I want to make sure I drag all of the white part of the paddle inside of our collision shape. And if you click on the blue part, you can also move the entire shape around. And if you hold shift, then you move it only in one axis, which can make things a lot easier. And I want to make sure I only cover the whitish part and let me, yeah, okay. I think this looks good. If you want to be more precise with this, you can also click on the rectangle in the inspector and in here you can give it very specific coordinates. So you could, for example, let me go with 14 and 60. So we have cleaner numbers, although that doesn't really matter. But okay, now we have our player character. This is really all our player character is ever going to be. It consists of a kinematic body, an image, and a collision shape. This is literally all you need to create a player. So let me save the scene by pressing Ctrl S and run the scene. And now we can see our player in the top left, which isn't too good. So let me drag the entire thing a bit more to the middle. And I can do that either by having player selected and going to transform and moving it here. So I could press something like 100 and 500. And let's say more like 300. Or you could just drag and drop it. But there's one more problem before I finish this part. If we were to just select this thing and try to drag it, you would only select the node furthest down in the scene tree. So the collision shape in this case, which would be a problem because our player would collide in this shape, but we would see the player here. So this is no good. So what we have to make sure is that when we have this player selected, that we can't move the sprite or the collision shape. And for that, you have at the top here an icon that looks like this. It's very hard to explain. All it does is it makes sure that you cannot select children nodes. And if you click on it, you can see this icon here. And if that's the case, you can only select the parent node, not the children nodes. And this makes sure that all of these nodes always stay in the same place. So now I can move it roughly, let's say, to the left side of the screen. And this is a really important part I do want to talk about. That to create our game, we are basically creating an illusion to the player. 
that what the player is actually going to control later on is the kinematic body 2D. So one specific point in space. It just happens to be that attached to this node, we have an image of a paddle and a shape with the size of this paddle. So the player assumes all of this is one object, but in reality, it really isn't. But, uh, but okay, I think this part is getting quite long, so let's get to the next stage. And that is to actually give our player the ability to move, which is what we are going to do with code. So let's have a look at that. So let's talk about how our player can move. And for that, we have to talk about programming in Godot. And there are different languages you can use to code in Godot. The language we are going to use is called GDScript, which is insanely similar to Python. I talked about this earlier in this video. But it's also a really simple language. So even if you never coded before, this should still work for you. Or at least I hope it will. But before we're getting into specific code, there's one important concept. That in Godot, code is always connected to a node. And what you effectively do is you take a node and take all its attributes and you create additional capabilities. And each node can be expanded in different ways. So for example, a kinematic body 2D can get different functionalities compared to a sprite node, for example. But you don't have to worry about this too much for now. Let's actually start creating some code. So here we're back in our player scene and I have our player node selected. And to create a script, you have to use this icon here, which says attach a new or existing script to the selected node. So I click on it and now we have a couple of options. The first one is the language we want to use and we want to use GDScript. Then we have inherit, and this is the node we are starting from that we're going to use to expand its capabilities. So kinematic body 2D node is fine. Then we have a template, as default, empty and no comments. I will leave it now at default, but later on you definitely want to start with empty. Then we have built in script, which is just asking you if you want to save the script as its own file or as part of the node. It's usually left off, but it really doesn't matter. And then we have the name of the file, so player in my case, and where we want to store it, also in the player folder. So all of this is fine by default usually. So I click on create, and now at the top we can see script, and we can see our script. And if you want to go back to your viewport, you can just click on 2D at the top, or go back to script. And you can also use the F keys to switch between them, where F1 is 2D, F2 is 3D, and F3 is the script view. And this does make it quite a bit easier to switch between the different views, and I'm going to use that quite a bit. But all right, in here, we can see a couple of examples Godot provides. And let me actually get rid of this part down here, but we are going to come to that later on. So what you see here right now is that you can declare a member variable. And a variable in essentially any programming language is a box that you can store information in. And this can be either a number, like the number two, or it could be text. And text is usually called a string. And a number without a decimal is called an integer. So these are different data types. Although that really isn't too much at this stage if you're new to programming. But okay, let me get rid of all of this because we don't need it. So just to get it started, I want to create one variable. So I use the keyword var, and now I have to give the variable a name. And I wanna go with speed because I want to use this variable to determine how fast our player can go. And I need to assign it a value, and this is done with the equal sign. And now I have to type a number how fast I want my player to be. And I want to go with 400. And I've chosen this number by just trial and error. So if you play around with this later on, there are lots of different options, there's no universal one, just choose whichever one looks best. But all of this is still just a number, it doesn't actually do anything in our game. And to actually do stuff in our game, we need a function. And a function is really just a collection of different lines of code that you all execute as one block. And usually for a function, you have two steps. You first have to create a function, and then you have to call the function. And this basically means that you first have to create your code of block, and then you have to use the code of block in specific spots where you want to use it. In Godot, this is slightly different, that you have two different kinds of functions. You still have the normal functions that you have to create and call yourself, but you also have inbuilt functions. And these functions you only have to create, you don't have to call them yourself, because Godot is going to call them at specific points in your game. So for example, we have a ready function, and this function is always going to be executed when our scene is ready. 
or there would be an input function that is always executed when we get player input. So for these functions, Godot determines when they are being executed, which is really useful for your game. And for our player, we actually do want to start with an inbuilt function. And really what we want is to have a function that is being executed on every single frame of our game. So essentially a function that runs constantly. And Godot has two of them. They are called process and physics process. And those two functions are incredibly similar. And you don't have to worry about the differences in too much detail yet. At least for this stage, just keep it at process is usually used when you don't care about physics and physics process is being used when you really want to calculate physics calculations, which in our case, we do want to do. So we are going to use that function. But again, lots of theory. Let's actually get back into our code editor and let's implement this. So here I'm back in my code editor and let me go to a new line and to create a function, we need the func keyword. And now we need the name of our function. And in my case, this is physics process. And into this function, you can pass what is called an argument. And Godot by default passes in an argument in here that's called delta. And all an argument really does is when you're executing a function is that you can tweak the parameters. So this one can be useful to fine tweak what the function is doing. And what Delta does in Godot is that it makes sure that the game always runs at a consistent speed, which isn't something you have to worry at this stage in too much detail. So I would recommend to just ignore it at least for now. But all right, if you press enter now, Godot is going to go to the next line and it's going to indent the next line. And this indentation is really important. It means that whatever code is below and indented in this function belongs to the function. So further down the line, if you created more code below this function that is not indented, it would mean it doesn't belong to the function. But now in this function, we have to give our player the ability to move around. And to move around, we are going to need three different steps. Number one is that we actually need player input so that we check if the player is pressing up or down in my case, but could be any kind of input. Number two is that we are storing this input. And number three is that we're actually applying this input to our player. And let's go through this step by step. And before getting to the input, I do want to start with some kind of variable that can store the user input. And I'm going to use a vector. And if you paid attention in high school, you might remember a vector. But vectors are generally useful in game development and really important. And fortunately, they're also quite easy. A vector is essentially an arrow that can point in different directions. And what we want is that by default, we have a vector that doesn't point in any direction. But if we're pressing the up key, we want it to point upwards. And if we're pressing the down key, we want it to point downwards. And that's really all we need. So let's actually create this. So here I'm back in my code and I want to create a new variable. So again, I need the var keyword. And now I have to give this variable a name. And usually this one is called velocity, which I am remarkably bad at spelling for some reason. My brain just can't get around it. But all right, now we want to create a vector. And for that, we just need the vector keyword. And Godot now asks us, do we want a 2D vector or a 3D vector? And since we have a 2D game, we want a 2D vector. And now when you press a dot, you can access its attributes. So what the arrow is pointing at by default. And what I want to go with is zero, all in uppercase letters. And this means that by default, this vector is zero, zero. So it doesn't point in any direction. It's just a point in space although we can influence this. And that actually comes now, because now we're getting keyboard input. And for keyboard input, we need a specific keyword that is called input. And here again, we need a dot sign to use a specific part of this input. So the input is essentially a large object that has lots of different functions that you can all access with a dot. And the one we want to access is called is action pressed. And all this does is it checks for specific keys. And here you have a list that are predefined, but you could create your own. And what I want to look for is UI up, which is the up key on your keyboard. So if I click on this, we have it as an argument inside of this function. And this is actually bringing us to a new data type, and that is a Boolean. And Booleans can either be true or false. So in our case, if we were to run this game and we press the up key, this entire line would signal that something is true. And if we don't press the up key, it would be false. And to actually use this in code, we need an if statement. So that if 
all of this is true, we want to do something, and else we don't want to do that. And then to finish this line, we need a double colon. And now when I press enter again, we again start on an indented line. So this means that anything that comes below is only being executed if this line is true. So if we are pressing the up key. And if that is the case, we want to target our velocity again. So here be aware, in here, we are creating velocity, in here, we are using velocity. So you only have to create a variable once. Once you have done that, you can just use the keyword and work with it. And a velocity has an X and a Y attribute that you can influence, with X being the horizontal one and Y being the vertical one. So we want Y because we want to go up and down. And all we have to do in here is to change this number to a different number so it's pointing in a certain direction. So I want to take this value and subtract one from it, which happens with minus, equal, and one. So this kind of operation is really common in programming languages. It basically means we are taking this value and subtracting one from it. So this would be the same as velocity.y equals velocity.y minus one. These two lines do exactly the same thing, except this one is quite a bit faster to write. Okay, and this is all we need for this one line to move the player upwards. But obviously, we also want to go downwards. And here again, if you want to challenge yourself, pause the video now and try to implement the code for the down movement. But to do it, all you have to do is to copy this line or really type it yourself, it doesn't matter. And now instead of looking for UI up, we want to go for UI down. And in here, instead of subtracting one, we want to add one. And this is something that might be weird to you right now, that if you want to go up, we have to subtract from y, and if you want to go down, we have to increase y, which is going to be really strange if you paid attention in high school. So let me explain. In high school, when you saw a coordinate system, it always started in the bottom left. So if you went to the right, you have to increase x, if you want to go up, you have to increase y, which tends to make sense. In most video game developments, this is slightly different because the origin point is in the top left, meaning that if you want to go to the right, you still have to increase x. This one stays the same. However, if you want to go down, you have to increase y. And if you want to go up, you have to decrease y, which is honestly really counterintuitive and is going to take you some time to get used to, but it just became the standard in quite a lot of engines. I have no idea why, but you will get used to it eventually. So don't worry about it too much. But with all of that covered, we have the two first steps to get input. We have code to get input from the player and we can store the input. Now we just have to apply this input to our player. And this happens with the move and slide function. So I type move and slide. And in here, Godot already gives us some hints in terms of what it needs. And the first argument it wants in here is a linear velocity, which we have, it's our velocity. And well, that's all we needed. So let me save this entire thing now. And let me run the scene by clicking again on this icon at the top or pressing F6. And now we can see our player and let me move up. And we can see that our player is moving up just very, very slowly. And that's for a good reason. Let me close this again, because we are only moving it by one unit, but we want to move it by this 400. And so all we really need to do is to multiply this one by 400. So when we call this move and slide function, we just multiply velocity by our speed. And now if I run this again by pressing F6, now we can move up and down. This feels so much better. Okay, and there was a ton of theory in this part of the video. So I think it's good for this section. So let's talk about creating our level. For now, our entire game consists of a single scene, and that's the player scene. But obviously this is quite limited, because we want to have other elements in our game as well. We want to have a ball and the opponent at the very least, and each of them is going to be their own scene. But we have to bring all of them together into one big scene, and this is going to be the level scene, where we're actually going to create our game logic. And our level doesn't actually have to do all that much, it's quite a simple thing. It really only has to carry all the other scenes and have a bit of extra code to reset the ball, for example, or to limit the movement of the player. 
So let's actually go right in and let's create this. So here I'm back in my game. And what I want to do is to click on this plus icon and create a new scene. And we are still in the code view. So I go back to 2D and here we can again see our 2D space. And now we have to determine what kind of node do we want. And in this case, you could go with a 2D scene, but you don't really need it. So I'm going to go on other node and I'm going to just click on node, which is the base class for all scene objects, which is a fancy way of saying this node is a really basic node that can't really do anything by itself. And let's click on create. So now we have a node and let me rename it to level right away. And if you look into the inspector, you can't really see anything. So we have pause and script, but they don't do much. So this node is so basic, it doesn't really have any attributes. So it can't do all that much, but it is really useful to organize your code. So you can put other nodes connected to it. And this is what I want to do. I want to connect our player scene to this level node. And for that, we have to instance our player into this new scene. And let me actually save it before we do anything. So right now, when you look at the tab, it says unsaved. So I press on Control or Command S. And here again, we can see our folder. And I want to create a new folder that I'm going to call level. And in here, I want to save this scene as level scene because our root node is called level. So click on save. And now we have our level scene. And now with this level selected, click on this chain icon. And this is the instancing icon. And if you click on this, you can see all of our scenes. We have a level scene and we have a player scene. And we want the player scene. So I click on open. And now we can see our player scene inside of our level. And it is still going to have the same capabilities. So if we were to run this scene now, our player character would still work in exactly the same way. And let's actually try this. So again, I press on F6. And now we have the very same thing, even though we have a different scene. So now we are running the level scene, not the player scene, but the player scene is part of the level scene. Okay, cool. So this works quite well. And now we can actually add more useful stuff to this. And the very first thing I want to add is that, let me run the game again. If I go up and down, we can move outside of the screen, which well is unintentional. So we want to add something that the player can't go outside of the screen. And there are different ways to achieve this. But before I work on this, I do want to work on how large our game is supposed to be. So let me close this. So right now here, our game has the size of this blue rectangle. And we can influence how large this is going to be. And to influence this, you have to go all the way to the top to project and project settings. And in here, you have all the settings for the project. And if I go down a little bit, there we have display and window. And in here we can change the width and the height of our window. And by default, this is always 1024 by 600. And you can leave it at that, it's perfectly fine. But I feel like 1280 by 720 tends to feel a bit better, but it's really up to you. You can also change if it's resizable or borderless or full screen, it's really up to you, play around with this. But for now, I'm not going to worry about screen scaling in any meaningful way. So I'm just going to close it. And now we can see that our blue box has increased in size by quite a bit. And if I were to run this game, we would also see it is quite a bit larger now. So we know this is working. Good start. But now the actual important part. We want to limit our player from moving outside of the screen. And we can approach this in two different ways. One is that we can give our player some code that it can't move outside of the screen. Or number two, we could use another physics body to limit the movement. So, so far we have seen a kinematic body. We could use another physics body at the border of our screen that the player would collide with. And those would basically be walls. And since for our ball we also want to use walls, I am going to go with the second approach. So we have walls that limit our player, our opponent, and also make our ball bounce. So we have lots of functionality in one object, which is really nice. And for that, we have to talk about another physics object in Godot, which is called the Static Body 2D. And I think the name already explains it quite well. It's, well, a static body that can't move by itself. 
So it is essentially a wall. And that is really it. It's just a physics body that can't move by itself. But if other objects move against it, they will be influenced by its physics. And static body 2Ds also work like a kinematic body 2D. That you start with a single node that has the physics and then you have to give this node a shape. So let's actually create all of this. So here I'm back in my level scene. And with the level node selected, I want to add another node. That is going to be a static body. And here again, you have a static body in 3D and a static body in 2D. And I want to go with 2D. So I click on create. And here again, we have a static body 2D and we're getting an error message that this node has no shape. So let's give it one. So with this node selected, and not the text, I'm going to click on the plus icon and I want to give it a collision shape. This one down here. So click on create. And still we can't see anything. We get another error message again that we have to provide a shape. And this happens again in the inspector. And here I just click on whatever shape I want. And I think again, we want to go with a rectangle shape 2D because, well, the wall doesn't need any fancy shape. A rectangle is fine. So I click on this. And now we have a wall that a player couldn't collide with. And let me actually demonstrate this. So I'm going to drag this out a bit and move it, let's say here. So when we run our game, we should not be able to move past this point. So I save the game and press F6 again to launch it. And let's move up. And indeed, I can't move further up than this point. So this is working. But obviously we want to be limited by the top of the screen. So we have to change all of this and move this entire shape to the top or this blue line. And let me zoom in quite a bit that we want to be right on this blue or red line. And to be more fine grained, you can also use the arrow keys and move it up or down. Or you could use transform and use it here. And let's actually go with that. So I have transform open and I also click on rectangle again. So now we can see the dimension and the position. And all we need to do is to change this to minus 10. And this is going to bring us exactly 10 units from the top of the screen. And now we want to have this static body cover the entire top part of the screen. So I'm just dragging it out. And this would be fine. Or if you want to be a bit better looking for the game, you can also move it to the middle and have the size a bit more appropriate for it. So it doesn't move massively outside of it. And yeah, I think this looks about right. And here, if you look at our scene tree, now we have a bit more of a complex structure. We have a root node, the level. We have one child that's the player. And we have a static body that's also a child of the level node. But now this static body 2D has its own child, which is the collision shape 2D. So if we were to move this static body, we would move the collision shape 2D. But if we move the level, we would move both the static body 2D and the collision shape because they're both children of the level node. Okay. Let me rename this one to wall top and then you can minimize it, which makes it easier to work with in your game. And this is giving us our top wall. So let's try this by running our game and I can move all the way to the top of the screen, but not further. So this is working quite well. Cool. So now we have to create a wall at the bottom of our screen. And here again, if you want to challenge yourself, pause the video now and try to do this yourself. But effectively, all you have to do is to copy this entire wall top by pressing Ctrl D. And let me rename it right away to wall bottom. And then you can just drag the entire thing down. And here again, you can see that I'm moving the collision shape, not the static body. Although in this case, it wouldn't matter too much because this collision shape is what actually matters. But it doesn't feel good. So with the wall bottom selected, I'm going to click on this icon again, that we cannot select the children. And now I can move the static body down. And let me zoom in again. And I want to roughly move it at the bottom of the screen. Or if you want to be really precise about this, you could also move it to 740. Yeah. And okay, this is all we needed. And let me 
change the same things so it's all consistent. And let's run the game now. And I can't move to the top and I can't leave the screen from the bottom. So this is working quite well. Cool. And we are making some decent progress. And with that one done, let's start by creating our opponent. And the opponent is actually done in a really similar way compared to our player. As a matter of fact, it is going to have the same nodes, it is just going to have some slightly different code. So instead of using keyboard import to move this one, we are going to make this one move to wherever the ball happens to be. But this part will come later when we actually have a ball. For now, let's just create a basic opponent. So here again, we are in our level scene. And I want to create a new scene for the opponent. So I click on the plus icon at the top to add a new scene. And here we have the scene. And what we want to do is to basically copy this player scene and do the same thing except for the code. And this again could be a challenge if you want to code along. Pause the video now and try to recreate our player. But let me go through it. I want to start with another node that is going to be a kinematic body 2D. And this time, I guess that's one difference, I want to name this opponent. And again, we're getting the warning, but I'm going to ignore it for now because I want to start by adding the picture. So I click on this plus icon and I type in sprite. And I'm going to add the sprite. And here again, we're going to use our assets and the paddle. It is the same as the player has. And here, now we have an opponent that is a kinematic body and a sprite. Now I want to add our collision shape. So here you could add a collision shape 2D. And this works just like for the player. You can add a rectangle shape 2D and move it roughly in place to where this needs to be. Uh, something like this. So yeah, I think this looks good. And just for completion's sake, what you could also do, so let me just hide this one for now. You could also use a collision polygon 2D. And this one works in basically the same way, except now you cannot select a pre-built shape. Instead, at the top of the screen, you can see these three icons. That says create points, edit points, and delete points or erase points. And what you basically do with a collision polygon is you are creating your own shape. So when I click on create points, I can literally just put points on the screen. So if you have a more complex shape, this one would be quite easy. And then if you're at the last point, just click on enter and then it finishes the shape. So now we also have a square shape, but this shape could be any point. So if you add a point, you could create something much more complex. But in my case, I well don't need to. So I'm happy by just using a collision shape because this one is much easier and we don't have any fancy shapes. And yeah, that's literally all we needed. So now I'm going to save this entire scene in its own folder that I'm going to call opponent. And again, it's already named appropriately. So I click on save. And this is our opponent. So now this I can also put into our level scene. And here again, I have the level node selected. I click on the chain icon to instance it and put an opponent and now move opponent roughly in place. Okay, this looks good. So now let me save this level scene and run the entire thing. We can see that we have two paddles and we can only move our player. Our opponent is not moving and we don't have a ball, but that comes later. But I think we're making decent progress. There's two more things I would like to add though. Number one is to make this level scene our default scene. So right now we have always only played a single scene and this happened with F6. But what we can also do is run the entire game as a whole and our game consists of different scenes. But by default, Godot does not know which is the default scene it needs to start for the game. And this we have to define ourselves. And all this really means is when you click on F5, Udo is going to ask you that no main scene has been defined. Do you want to select one? And we do. So I click on select. And here we would have all of our folders. And I want the level scene to be the main scene. So I click on level scene. And now we can see our level again. And now even if we were in our player scene, I could press F5 
and I could start the actual game, how it's supposed to be looking when it's actually being played. So this one makes it easier to launch games. But okay, um, let me close the player and the opponent scene. Closing them doesn't mean you delete them. You can still open them from the file system. So down here, so down here, you could just double click on the player scene and reopen it. But all right, the last thing for the level is that this gray background looks absolutely hideous. So I want to change it. And to change it, we have to add another node. So with level selected, I'm going to click on the plus icon again, and I want to add a color rect, which is, well, it's a colored rectangle, kind of like the name implies. So I click on create. So now we have this colored rectangle on the top of our screen, and let me zoom in a little bit. So here you can see the color, and you can influence the color here. And I will talk about this in just a second. But for now, what you do have to be aware of is that when you look at the color of this node, it's green. And this means that it's a UI node. So Godot essentially has four different kinds of nodes. We have the blue ones, those are 2D nodes. Then we have the red ones, those are 3D nodes. Then we have the green ones, those are UI nodes. And then we have all the other nodes. Like the plain node, for example, it's just another node. It doesn't really have a specific group. And UI nodes have a couple of specific parts that are really powerful. And effectively what they can do is be really responsive to the size of the window. So you can always make sure they're, for example, in the middle of the screen, always cover the entirety of the screen. Which in our case isn't going to matter too much because the game isn't designed to be resizable. Although we could add that later on. But we could, for example, make it cover the entire screen really easily. Let's actually do this. So here we are back in our editor. And with the color rect selected, at the top you can see these two green icons that say layout, and then you have this anchor kind of icon. And if you click on layout, you have lots of different options. And what you can click is full rect, and then this rectangle is immediately covering the entire screen. And right now it's covering everything, even our players, which we don't want. So I'm going to move this colored rect above all the other elements, so it's below them. So now we can see our player and our opponent again. And here you would have a couple more elements that we are going to see in a bit more detail later on. But for now, just be aware that UI elements have lots of options to arrange elements on the screen. But okay, now the white color doesn't look too good. So we have to give it a different color. And here we have quite a few different options in terms of how we are going to work with color. We have RGBA numbers, we have HSV, we have RAW, and we have hexadecimal numbers. And every single one of them are a different way to create a color. What we are going to use is the hexadecimal number, which is the one down here. And the number I want is 14, 21, and 26. And now if I press enter, we get a dark color. And let me explain how this works. A hexadecimal number always consists of six different numbers that follow a hashtag. And the first two digits define the amount of red, the third and the fourth digit determine the amount of green, and the last two digits determine the amount of blue. So the higher the number gets, the more amount of this color we have. And the way we are counting a hexadecimal number is going to look a little bit weird, because we're counting from 0 to 1, and then from A to F. So it basically goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, A, B, C, D, E, and F. So there are 16 different stages that you can have. And then you have three different colors and you essentially mix them. And I hope that makes sense. But okay, with that, we have our background color. So now when I press F5, this does start to come together and look quite decently. So with all of these parts covered, let's actually start talking about how to create our ball. So our ball is going to be the most complex object in the entire game, which basically means it's going to be the object with the most amount of code. But in terms of nodes, our ball is actually going to be remarkably similar compared to the player and the opponent. We will still start with a kinematic body 2D, add an image, and add a collision shape. And I think you really start to notice that there is a pattern. That most objects in Godot work in really similar ways. That you always have some kind of physics node, then you add a picture, and then you add a collision shape. And this can be more complex. For example, the image could be an animation or the collision shape could be more complex. But really, at the most basic level, most objects in Godot work really similarly. 
so it's really easy to create them. So let's start to create our ball. So here we're back in our editor and I want to create a new scene. And again, I'm going to pick another node. And here again, I'm going to pick kinematic body 2D. And I'm going to rename this one to ball. And I'm going to add a sprite. And I am going to add a collision shape 2D. And for the sprite, this time, I'm going to go to my assets and add the ball. And then for the collision shape, let me zoom in a bit. I am going to pick a circle shape 2D this time, because now we have a circle, we don't have a rectangle anymore. And in here, now we only have one red dot, because a circle is a bit of an easier shape. And I'm just going to drag out this red dot to make sure this circle roughly matches our ball. And that's all we needed. So now let me save this in a new folder that I call ball and save this as ball.scene. Cool. And now I go back to my level scene and instance the ball into it. Now we can see the ball on the top of the screen and let me move it roughly in the middle of the screen, at least for now. And that's all we needed for the basic ball. So if I run the game now by pressing F5, we can see all the very basic elements of our game. So that's a pretty decent start. So now we can close this game for now. And now we actually have to make our ball move. And that's going to be the more complex part. So let's go through it step by step. With the ball selected, I'm going to create a new script. And here again, we have all the same options, except this time I want to start with an empty template. But the folder is still fine, so I click on create. And here now we are starting with a completely empty code, except that our code extends a kinematic body 2D, so this one is fine. And here again, I want to create a couple of basic variables that are going to be important for our ball. And the first one is going to be the speed of the ball. So speed equal to, let's say, 600. Again, you can play around with this value, it just determines how fast the ball is going to be. And another important thing, let me open my player script again. So on the left, you can see all the open scripts. And if you go to the file system and click on player.gd, for example, you could open the old script. And right now what we have is that our player has a speed variable and our ball has a speed variable. And that's fine. Each of these nodes has its own scope, meaning that you can have a variable named speed for the ball and a variable named speed for the player and even a variable named speed for the opponent. That's perfectly fine. It doesn't matter if they have the same name. So this one is a good start. And then this time I want to create a velocity vector again. And this one again is going to be a vector 2.0. So an arrow that doesn't point in any particular direction. And here do note the difference that for our player, we created this velocity inside of the physics process. Whereas for the ball, we are creating it outside of it. And there's a specific reason that you're going to see in just a second. Actually, right now. So the reason we have to define velocity outside of a function is because we want to use it in lots of different functions. So what I effectively want to do is when our ball is ready, I want to change this vector 2.0 to a specific direction. And then I want to use this direction in the actual game in the physics process. So we couldn't define this velocity inside of a function because we want to use it across multiple functions. Oh yeah, and this is something I haven't mentioned before. So let's say open the player again. If you create a variable inside of a function, this variable is only available inside of this function. So this velocity here is only going to be available inside of this physics process function. So we couldn't use it outside of it. But in this case, it's fine because we don't need it outside of it. And it helps to keep our code clean. But in case of this ball velocity, we do need to use it in different functions. So it's important to define it outside of a function. Okay, cool. So now when our ball is ready, we want to give it a random direction. So we first have to run a function that only runs when our ball is ready. And I talked about this a tiny bit earlier. It's called the ready function. And do remember the underscore, that one is quite important. And use the double colon again. And now we're indented in the line. 
So any code we put in here is only going to run once when the ball scene is ready. And what I want to do is to target velocity and now target the X attribute of it. And now I want to give it a random number. And this is a topic we haven't covered yet in Godot, how to create random numbers. And there are a couple of different ways. And to get to a random number, we actually have to cover a couple of different concepts. So I think the best way to go on about this is to first write the line and then explain how the line works. So let me write the entire thing. Okay, so this line is probably going to look really confusing. So let me go through it step by step. And there's actually going to be a new kind of data type we have to talk about. So we are starting the entire thing with square brackets where we have minus one and one. And this is called an array. And an array is basically just a list. So in this array, we have two numbers that are minus one and one. You store different numbers inside of a list. So it's kind of comparable to a shopping list. And this allows us to store different values inside of a single data type. So this can be quite useful. So basically what we have right now is a box with two values inside, minus one and one. And essentially what we are doing with the other square brackets is to pick one of these numbers at random. And this process is called indexing. That after you're putting square brackets after an array and put an integer inside of it, you are picking a specific value from this array with a number zero picking the first element, a number one picking the second element, and so on. And be aware here that the first element in an array is always the number zero. But we want to pick a random integer. And for that, we have the function randi. And randi generates a random integer. But by default, it generates a random integer across an infinite range. So that's not good. So we have to add the modifier two after it. And this is what this entire part does. It generates a random number that's either zero or one. And then this random number zero or one is being used to pick either the minus one or the one. And I hope that makes sense. It's a tiny bit more complex. I will put a link into the description of this video to explain this in more detail if you are interested. But okay, this covers our X speed. So our horizontal speed. Now we need to talk about the vertical speed. And this happens in exactly the same way. So instead of X, I change this to Y, and we are almost good to go. The one thing I do want to change is that minus one and one feels a bit too steep. So if we were to leave it at this, our ball would start moving in a 45 degree line, which I think would look quite slow. So instead, I want to lower the degree. So this one could be 0 0.8 and, or minus 0 0.8 and 0 0.8. So what this effectively means is that our ball is going to move to left and to the right by the unit of one, but it's only going to move up and down by a unit of 0 0.8 or negative 0 0.8. So it is moving faster in the horizontal direction than it is moving in the vertical direction. And for now, that's all we needed for the direction of the ball. Now, just like for the player, we can go with func physics process. And all we have to do now is to use the move and slide function and add in our velocity. And let me actually try this and see if this is working. So I press F5. And we can see that our ball is moving very, very, very slowly. And again, the reason for that is that we have to multiply it by our speed. So now let's try this again. And there we go. There is, you can see at the top, the ball doesn't bounce, but that's okay. We can work on that in just a bit. For now, I think this seems okay. But there's one more thing I do want to add before finishing this part. That, let me run the game again. Our ball is again moving to the top right. And if I press it again, our ball is again going to move to the top right. And the reason for that is that these random numbers are not perfectly random. And let me explain what Godot does. Whenever you use a random number in Godot, what Godot effectively does is it creates what's called a seed. And a seed is really just a long list of numbers that Godot picks from. But Godot always uses the same seed, which always gives us the same number. So these numbers are not actually random. But we can change that by using the random mice function. So now, whenever our scene is ready, Godot is going to pick a random seed to pick numbers from. Meaning that now, when we run our game, the ball doesn't start 
to the top right every time it can move in random directions. And I hope at some point it moves to the left. There we go. Okay, so this is also working as well. Cool. Obviously the ball needs to bounce, so let's talk about that. So bouncing something off in Godot with a kinematic body is actually really easy, because there's a specific function for it, and it's called move and collide. And move and collide works kind of similar compared to move and slide. They are both moving a specific kinematic body in a certain direction, given the vector you put into it. But when they're colliding with something, they are doing different things. When move and slide collides with an object, it slides along the surface of this object. Whereas move and collide by default doesn't do anything, but it returns what's called a collision object. And you can use this collision object to make the object bounce off whatever we have hit. So this is what we are going to do. Instead of using move and slide, we're going to use move and collide and use that to calculate the angle we have to bounce off. And I think it is best to do this right in code. So here we are back in Godot and we have the code for our ball open right now. And I don't want to use move and slide, so I'm going to delete it. And I want to use move and collide. And again, move and collide needs a vector, so we need velocity. So far, this is exactly the same. And again, I also want to multiply it by speed. But now there's one difference already, that we have to multiply move and collide by delta. And now with that, let me explain what delta does. Delta is the amount of time that has passed since the last frame of the game was called. So let's say if our game runs at 60 frames per second, then the difference between each frame is about 17 milliseconds. And Godot is using that number to calculate how fast the game is going to run. And let me illustrate why this matters. Imagine you have a game on two different computers, one computer being really fast, the other computer being really slow. Now the fast computer is going to be able to run a computer really fast, so you might have frame rates like 200, whereas the slow computer might only get something like 20 frames per second. Now, if we didn't account for the faster frame rate, the game on the fast computer would run about 10 times as fast as compared to the slow computer, which should make it really weird to play the game on the different computers. Also within the same game, if you come to the scene that is more complex, the game might slow down and feel inconsistent. So we have to account for different frame rates. And that is what delta is for. And really delta is just a very, very small number that measures the time since the last frame. And really what happens if you have a fast computer, delta is going to be really small but applied very often, whereas if you have a slow computer, delta is going to be comparatively larger, but it is going to be applied less often. But both of these are going to equal out, so the game is going to run at the same speed. So the movements inside of the game are at the same speed. And move and slide applies delta automatically, whereas move and collide does not. And the reason for that is that move and collide does more with physics, so we need more control over it. Now the important thing is that move and collide, whenever it hits something, it is going to return what's called a collision object. And this we can store in a variable. So let me create a new variable that I call collision object. And this we just assign with the equal sign. So whenever we come to this line here, Godot is going to run this function and move our ball. But then when this function is colliding with an object like our wall, it is going to return a value, this collision object. And this collision object we can use to change the velocity of our player, so the direction it is moving in. And this we do, we first check if this collision object exists in the first place, which we can just do by typing if collision object. And that's all we need. So if this kind of object exists, then this line is going to evaluate to true. And then this if statement is going to trigger, so we can use it like that. And if that is the case, we want to change our velocity because that is the direction we are moving in. So we have to assign it a new value. So use the equal sign. And here we have to use velocity again and then use the bounce keyword. And this one bounces a vector. And into this bounce vector, we have to pass in the collision object. And not just that, but we also need the normal of this collision object. So this line is going to look quite weird. So let me explain what's happening here. And let me illustrate this actually. So here you can see a ball colliding with a wall. And we want to bounce this ball off this wall. And to do that, we are going to need what's called a normal. And a normal is just the direction a specific surface is facing. So our wall right now is facing upwards, for example. 
And this normal we then can use to bounce the ball off in the right direction, so the correct one for the bounce direction. And all of this is done with the bounce method. But well, that's all we needed. So let's actually try to run this game and see what happens. So yeah, there we go. So the ball goes right outside of the screen. Let me run it again. And we can even bounce off the pedal. And oh, it's actually working, nice. So here we have a bouncing ball. So this works quite well, actually. And with that, we almost have a working game. There's one more thing we need, and that is to have an opponent that can actually move along with the ball. And that's going to come in the next section. So what this means is that we have to talk about artificial intelligence, at least on a very, very, very basic level. But effectively, this is what we are doing. We are giving our opponent some kind of basic intelligence so that it can follow the ball and we have an actual game. But obviously, we are not going to create anything sophisticated. So all I really want to do is if the ball is above the opponent, I want to move the opponent up. If the ball is below the opponent, I want to move the opponent down. And then the strength of the opponent is going to be determined by the speed of the opponent. And I think this is best explained while I'm actually doing it. So let's jump right into our game and let's do this. So here I'm back in my game and right now I only have the level scene open. And if you look to the right, you can see our opponent. And if you want to open a scene really fast, you can just click on this um, editor icon, I guess. And now we have opened our opponent scene. And I want to give my opponent a script. So I click on the script icon again. And here, all the usual stuff, I want an empty script. But let's say let's go with no comments so you can see what it looks like. And I click on create. So now we just have the function ready. And we're actually going to use it in just a bit, so I leave it here for now. And as always, I want to start with a speed variable, just like for the player and the opponent. And this one I'm going to set to 250. But now we do need another thing. For the opponent to function properly, it needs to know where the ball happens to be on the screen. So I want to create another variable that I call ball. And you don't actually have to assign any value by default. This one is fine. So this one doesn't have any value by now. And I want to pass a value into it once the scene is ready, which is going to be the ball. So once the ball scene is ready, I want to work with this variable. And let me first type what I'm doing and then explain. So I want to get parent and then find node. So what happens here? So whenever the ball scene is ready, it looks for its parent, which is in this case, our ball scene's parent is the level node. And then from this level node, we are looking for a specific node, which is the ball, which is really all we're doing here. That whenever our level scene is ready, we are looking for the main level node. And then from this node, we are trying to find a node called ball. And then we are storing whatever the result is inside of this ball variable. So now we can work very easily with this node. And now just as before, we have to add some more functions to move this thing, which again is going to be physics process delta. And here we just need move and slide and pass in the vector. And now here we don't have a vector just yet. So for now, let me just pass in vector 2.0. So this thing is not going to move at all because this arrow doesn't point in any direction. Instead, we have to add some more code to figure out where this ball is in relation to our opponent. And for this, I'm going to create our first regular function. So I'm going to call this func get opponent direction. It doesn't need any arguments. And here note, there's no underscore before it, meaning that this function has to be called for it to be run at all, which is different compared to this and this function. But I'm going to explain this when we get to it. So in here, we have to create some logic to figure out when the player has to move up and when the player has to move down. And we can work with that actually quite easily because we can get the position of both the ball and the opponent very easily. And let me explain what we are going to do in here. In the most basic sense, we are going to check is the ball above the opponent, then we move the opponent up. Is the ball below the opponent, then we move the opponent down. However, we are going to give a little bit of wiggle room so that we are only going to move the player up if the ball is slightly above the player. So if the ball and the opponent are roughly on the same height, we are not going to move the opponent. Because if we did, the opponent would adjust all the time and would look incredibly wiggly. So we have to create what's called a nested if statement. 
So we first have to check if there's enough distance between the ball and the opponent. And then inside of this if statement, we check if the ball is above or below the opponent. So let's get to it. I first want to do the outer if statement. That if there is enough vertical distance between the two. And for that, let me write the entire line first and then explain. So we want apps ball dot position dot y minus position dot y is greater than 25. So what does any of that mean? I think ball position dot y and position dot y are fairly clear. Ball dot position dot y is the y position of the ball. And position dot y is the position of this node here. So we are essentially subtracting one from the other. But we are putting this inside of an apps function. And absolute numbers are just always positive numbers. So let's say if we're getting something like minus 50 out of here, the absolute function will turn it into a positive number. And this is there to ensure that it doesn't matter if the ball is above or below the opponent. So we're just looking for the distance between the two, not if it's above or below. This comes on the next line. And what we want to check in here is if ball.position.y is greater than position.y. And if that is the case, we want to return one. And I'm going to explain what this means in just a bit. For now, just stick with me. And all what we are checking right now is if the ball position is if the ball is below the player. So if it has a greater y value. And if that is not the case, so else, we want to return a minus one. And again, don't worry about return right now. I'm going to cover this in just a bit. And now we have our two possibilities, that either the ball is below the opponent or it is above the opponent. So the else statement here. So if this entire if statement doesn't come to true, then we want to else return zero. And this is the entire logic to move the opponent. So let me explain what the return means. So every time a function is running, it returns a value. And let me actually open the code for our ball. So here we can see this line. We have move and collide, and this is returning a value into this collision object. So whenever this function is running, it returns a value. And when you create your own functions, you can set what the function is returning. So in this case, if this is true, our function is going to return one, or it might return a negative one, or it might return a zero. So really all this function does is if the ball is below the opponent, it returns a one. If the ball is above the opponent, it returns a minus one. And if neither of these are true, then it returns a zero. Whereas for the ball, this move and collide return the collision object. So something much more complex. But this number we can use immediately in here. So our vector two, when we add brackets to it, we can specify what directions we are looking at when we create this. And for the x, we just want it to be zero because we don't want to move the opponent left or right. We only want to move it up or down. And for up or down, we want to use this value here. So we can just call this function inside of this vector. So get, I called it opponent direction. So now, whenever Godot runs this function, it creates a vector inside it that doesn't move on the x, but for the y, it looks at this entire function what is being returned. And then again, we have to multiply the entire thing by our speed. And this is a slightly more complex example, so it's probably making sense to go over this a couple of times if you're new to programming or Godot. But let me run all of this and let's see if this is working. And yeah, it is. And really, nothing complex happens here. All that's really happening is that we check if the ball is above or below the opponent, and then we move the opponent up or down depending on where the ball is. So we have almost a workable game. There's one thing left to do that we have to reset the ball once it moves outside of the screen. So that's gonna come in the next part. And again, to achieve that, we have a couple of different options. We could just calculate something in code to check the position of the ball. But I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to use a node for this approach. And this is bringing us to the third kind of physics node. It's called an area 2D node. And an area 2D node doesn't really calculate physics. Instead, it just checks if a physics body is inside of it. So what I'm going to do is to put area 2D nodes to the left and to the right of the screen 
and whenever the ball is inside of them, I'm going to put the ball back to the middle of the screen. So really something very simple. So let's jump right into Godot and let's do this. So here we're back in our level scene and I want to add a few more nodes. So with the level selected, I click on the plus icon and now I want an area 2D node. I add it and here again, Godot wants it to have a shape. So I press Ctrl A and I add a collision shape 2D. And here, as always, I want to add a new rectangle shape. And here we can see our rectangle shape. And move it roughly into place. And here's one thing you do want to be aware of. That both of the wall top and the wall bottom, they are also physical shapes. So if the wall is colliding with the area 2D, this area 2D would also be triggered. So the area 2D, at least by default, only cares if any physical body comes inside of it. This could be a wall, this could be a player, this could be a ball. It doesn't matter. So at least in our case, we have to make sure that it doesn't collide with either of the walls. And granted, this isn't the best approach to do this kind of thing. But I think for our game at least, it's serviceable. So I'm not going to worry about it too much. But okay, now we have an area to the side of the screen. And the ball wouldn't bounce off this shape. It would go through it, but then this area to D node could tell us that it's colliding with the ball. But step by step. Before that, I want to copy this area to D and again select it so you can't select the children and move it all the way to the left behind your opponent. And this doesn't have to be too precise. Okay, now we have area nodes to the left and to the right side of the screen. And they are going to know that the ball has collided with them but by default, they're not going to tell us. And we have to add some specific functionality that they're actually telling us that the ball is colliding with them. And to do that, we have to cover a new concept that is called signals. And all a signal does is it helps us to make nodes communicate with each other. So in our case, what we want to do is if the ball is colliding with the area to denote, we want the area to denote to tell us that it's colliding with the ball. And that's really all there is to it. In a bit more detail though, when you're creating a signal, you always have to connect the signal to a node with some code because the signal is effectively creating a new function that works like an inbuilt function that it's only being called at specific instances. So for our area to denote, for example, it's only being called when it's colliding with a physical body. But okay, lots of theory, let's actually implement this. So here we are back in our Godot editor and I'm going to start worrying about our left side. And let me actually rename them to left and right and yeah i got the right side so i want this left side to tell this level scene when the ball is colliding with it so if left selected i go to the right and there's inspector and there's also node and if i click on that we have signals and groups for now we only look at signals groups come later but here let me expand this we have all the different options that could be signals and what we are looking for is body entered. So this signal is only being triggered when the body, like the ball, is entering this area to the node. So I double click on it. And now we have a problem. That we can only connect this signal to a node with some code. And it doesn't really make sense to connect it to the player, the opponent or the ball. Well, maybe the ball. But I want to connect it to the level itself. So what I have to do is to give this level its own script. So again, I click on the icon and I just click on empty and create a new script. And let me minimize this again because we don't need it. So now our level scene has a script as well. That doesn't really do too much, at least just yet. But again, I go to left and click on body edit again. And now if we double click on it, I can connect it to the level. And I could also give it a specific name, but usually the default names are fine. So I click on connect. And now inside of the script for our level scene, we have a new function. And this function is going to be triggered every time a body enters this area 2D. And we also have an argument with the body. And this is the body that entered the area 2D. So we could use this to influence the ball itself. And let's first try if this is working. And there's a really useful tool to check if something is working. It's called the print function. And let me just call it collision for now. So what we're doing in this line 
that if this function is being executed, we want to print this text, so collision. And we will be able to see this at the bottom in the output tab. So with this one open, let me run the game. And the boy goes outside. And unfortunately, we can't see anything because we're only checking the left side right now. We're not checking the right side. So let's try this again. Okay. Let's see when I get lucky. There we go. Okay. Now it's on the left side. Now we can see collision. So we know that this function here works and it only works if the ball is colliding with it. So print is really useful to test your code. But in my case, I don't really care about it for now. So what I want to do now is whenever this function is being triggered, I want to reset the ball. And that brings us to a new concept that we have to select different nodes from a starting node. So right now, let me open the opponent, for example. All of these methods, they always apply to the opponent node itself. We never try to influence the sprite node or the collision shape 2D. We always worked directly with the opponent node. But now this is slightly different because we want to go from the level node and influence the ball. So what we have to do in our code is first select the ball and then influence the ball. And we can do this very easily. And there are actually different ways of doing this. The easiest one is use the dollar sign and then the name of the node you want to target. So in my case, ball. So if you have this line here, we would only target the ball. And if I now, for example, change the position, we would only change the position of the ball, not the position of the level node. And that is actually what I want to do. And the position has to be a vector 2. And now we have to put in the x and the y position. And I want to go right in the middle of the screen. So it's 640 by 360. So when I open our screen dimensions again, so I just halved both of these numbers which brings our ball right in the middle of the screen. And at least for now, that is all we needed. But obviously this is just the left side. So we also have to connect the right side. And this could be a challenge again if you want to code along. So pause the video now and try to connect the right side with a signal and also reset the ball if the ball collides with the right side. But let me do it. So with the right side selected, I am going to click on body entered. And with body entered, I again connect the signal to the level scene and I don't change the name, but you could if you wanted to. And now I'm just going to copy this line here. And that's basically all we needed. So let's try all of this. And let me actually lose. And there we go. We have the ball starting again in the middle. Cool. And with that, we actually have a really basic game. All that's left to do now is to add some more refinements to make the game look a bit prettier. And that's going to come in the next part. And I'm going to start by adding a score, which is actually super easy to add. But it is going to require us to work with text, which is something we haven't done so far. But text is actually really easy. So let's actually jump right in and I will explain it while we are implementing it. So here again, we are in our level scene and I want to add some text. And text in Godot is called a label. And you have also a rich text label, but for now I just want a label, which is a really, really simple text, but it could be more complex, but I don't need that. So now we have a label. And if you look at the inspector, we can write, for example, test in there. And if I zoom in, we can see test. So this is working quite well. Obviously we don't want it to be in the top left of the screen. Instead, I want it to be roughly in the middle, a bit further to the left, so we can see it's the player score. And actually, let me rename it to player score. And here again, you can see it's a green node, just like our color rect. And I can actually put them together. That makes sense. And here we can use the layout again. And what I first want to do is to check for the full rectangle. So this node is looking at the entire screen. But our node is still in the top left. So effectively, what we have created is a really large text box with some text in the top left. So we have to change this text box to move the text right into the middle, which we can do. If you look at the inspector, you have align and V align, which is short for vertical align. And right now it's left and top. But if I change it to center and center, and now we have it right in the middle. 
It might look a bit deceptive because of the ball, but I just put the ball randomly on the screen, so the test is actually in the middle of the screen. And obviously we don't want it to be right in the middle, so I want to add a margin to it that is moved slightly further to the left. And this we can do under margin. And here we have left and right, and you can just move either of them. So let's go with negative 200. And this is going to move the text a bit further to the left. And all right, this looks fine. So now I can copy the entire thing. So I also have an opponent score. Opponent score. And this opponent score, I just moved the margin to 200, so it's a bit further to the right. And let me try off this in the game now. And yeah, we can see test and it looks roughly in the middle. Cool. So now we have two things to do. The first one is we have to update the score. And the second one is that this text doesn't look very good. So we have to update that as well. And let me start with the actual score. And this one is not that difficult to do. So I go back to our code. And in our code, I'm going to create two new variables. The first one is called player score. It's going to be zero by default. And then we also have an opponent score, which is also going to be zero. And now on every single frame of the game, I want to set these scores as the text for our player score and opponent score labels. And for this, this time we are going to just use the process function. So let me type func underscore process. So this process works kind of like the physics process, except in this case, we are not calculating anything physical. We're just setting some text. Hence, we're only using process, not physics process. And what I want to do in here is to first target our player, not player sprite, player score. And to change the text, I need text. And if you want to find out what the attributes are of a certain node, you can just look at the node itself, so player score in this case, and hover over what you want to influence. So if you hover over text, you can see property text. And this is what you have to use in the code to target this attribute. And then for this text, I want to set player score. But this would not be working by default because of the data type. Now this kind of text is looking for a string, so a certain kind of words. But this player score is a number. So we have to change this player score from a number to a text, which we can do very easily with the str method, which is called string. And all it really does is it takes a number and turns it into a string. So exactly what we need. So let me try this now. So now player score should be zero. And it is, cool. But it doesn't update yet. So we have to work on that. But before that, I'm going to copy this entire line and change it to opponent score and opponent score. And now if I run this, they should both be zero and they are. Cool. Now what we have to do is to update these two scores to reflect the actual score. And this we can actually do very easily because we already know if the ball is leaving on the left side of the screen or the right side of the screen. So if the ball is leaving on the left side of the screen, we know the player score is increasing by one. And if the ball is leaving on the right side, we have player score plus equal one. And this is all we needed for the score. So let me try this now. And let me get score. There we have one, two. Ah oh yeah, I messed up the sides. So I just have to change this one around. Oh no, it's player score and player score. Right. So on the left, this would be opponent score. Opponent score. Let's try this now. And yep, this looks better. And yep, this also works. And then we can actually see one more problem that we're going to cover later that either the opponent or the ball could be moved by the ball in terms of physics. But don't worry about this for now, we're gonna fix this in just a bit. But for now, we have a working score system. So what's left to do for now 
is to change the style of these fonts because they look pretty bad right now. And again, this is quite easy to do. So with the player score selected, we have custom fonts and custom colors. I'm going to start with custom fonts. If you open this tab, you have a drop down menu and you can type new bitmap font and new dynamic font. We want a dynamic font. So I click on it and now I have to type on dynamic font and don't worry about the text disappearing, that's normal. So I click on dynamic font and now we have settings, extra spacing, font and resource. And in font, we can set our custom font. And in our assets folder, there actually is a custom font. It's called Poets and One Regular. And if I drag it into, we can see a custom font. And here we can also change the size of it and we'll make it smaller. I think I went with 50, uh, possibly a bit large. Let's go with 40. And this would be a custom font. So if I run the game now, this one would look drastically better. Cool. And we can also change the color of this. So custom colors. And by default, it's black. And here you can change again the color around. And in my case, I'm going to use a hexadecimal number again. That is D9, D8, and D7, which is a fairly whitish color, but not perfect white. And all right. That's really all we need to make the text look prettier. Now we have to do the same thing for the opponent score. And again, if you want to challenge yourself, pause the video now and try this yourself. But all you really have to do is go again to custom fonts, create a dynamic font, click on dynamic font again, click to font, and now drag and drop the font in there from the asset folder. And then for settings, I went with a font size of 40, if I remember correctly. And now under custom colors, enable font color and click on it. And it was D9, D8 and D7. Click on enter and you're good to go. So let me run all of this again now. And we have our scoring system. So seems fine. And with that, we're actually making pretty good progress. In the next part, I'm going to add a count on timer. So there's a bit of a delay before the ball restarts. Okay then, a timer, and timers in Godot are actually fairly straightforward, because again, we have a specific note for that that we can use actually quite easily. And most specifically, what I'm trying to achieve are two things. Number one is that we're having a count on timer before the ball restarts after we have hit a goal. And number two is that I also want to display this count on timer so that we can see two, one and zero on the screen or something like that. Um, some short number that counts down from a certain number to zero. How long that is going to be is up to you. But I found two is a good starting point because three actually felt a bit too long. But the specific number really doesn't matter. Let's have a look at this. So here we are back in the code and the first thing I have to add is a timer node. So with our level selected, I click on the plus icon again and I want a timer node. And it literally says a countdown timer. So create. And again, I'm going to rename it to countdown timer. And if you look to the right at the inspector, you can see a couple of attributes. Number one is the wait time, so this is the length of the timer. Then we have one shot, so is this timer going to run just once or multiple times? In our case, this is going to be true. And then we have auto start, so if it starts by itself or if we have to trigger it. Quite straightforward. So in my case, I want wait time to be two and one shot to be on. And that's all we need for the attributes. But now obviously, if this timer were to run out, we would again need a signal to tell other nodes that the timer has run out. Kind of like for the signals for the area to denote for the left and right areas. So here, same principle. This timer right now would be running. However, we have to tell another node that it has triggered. So for this, again, we need a signal. And for that, I go to the top to node. And here we only have one really big signal. That's timeout. And this is when the timer reaches zero. So seems appropriate. So I double click on it and I'm going to connect it to our level. And here again, besides our signal for the right body entered and left body entered, now we also have a count on timer timeout. And now here's the logic I'm trying to achieve with this. That once we have scored a goal, I want the ball to return to the middle of the screen. And I also want our count on timer to start ticking down. And only once the count on timer has reached zero, 
then I want the ball to restart. So for now we are not going to worry about the text displaying all of this, we are just going to worry about the timer functionality. And this is bringing us to kind of a problem, that right now we're controlling our level scene, but we do want to influence the ball, which is in its own scene. So we need to work across different scenes. But from our level node, we want to tell our ball not to move anymore, at least for a certain amount of time. And there are a couple of ways to achieve this. The one I'm going to use is called a group, which is fairly similar to a signal, but with a slight difference. So let me illustrate. So far we have seen a signal, where let's say for a timer, where you send a signal from one node to the other. So let's say from our count on timer node to our level node, or from our area to the node to our level node. So you always start from one node and go to the other node. And for a group we are still starting at a single node. However now, we can target as many nodes as we want. So any node that is inside of a specific group can be targeted. And what this is really useful is that it doesn't matter where the node is. So it could be in a different scene, it could be inside of a scene of another scene. It doesn't matter as long as the node is inside of a specific group, we can always target it no matter where it is. So what I'm going to do is to put our ball inside of a group and then from our level scene I'm going to target that group. And then this group is going to tell the ball to execute certain functions. So let's actually implement this. So here I'm back in my code and let me just quickly save. Okay, and now I want to open my ball scene. So I click on ball and click on the little film icon. And here we have our ball again and I still have the nodes section open that is next to the inspector. So far we looked at signals. Now I want to click on groups. And then here all we can see is manage groups. We can type some text in here and click on add. And if you have a node selected in here, like I have for ball, and I can type in a name in here, let's say ball group, I can click on add. And now our ball is inside of the ball group, which you can see from this icon next to the node. It's a circle inside of a square. Bit of a random icon, but who cares. So now what this means is that this node is inside of a group. And whenever we target this group, we could also target the node itself. And how this most specifically works is that we are going to give this node a specific function. Let's say we are going to give it a function that I'm going to call stop ball. And all that this function does is it sets this speed to zero. So all we need is speed equal zero. And then inside of our move and collide function, if you multiply velocity and delta by zero, it is going to be zero, so the ball would stop moving. So exactly what we want. So now we have to figure out how to call this stop ball function from our level script. So I go back to our level script. Actually, let me save the script first, just to be sure. So what I want to do is when either of these two areas are being hit, I want to call the stop function. And for that, we need two commands. The first one is get tree. And the second one is call group. And in here, we could pass in the name of the group and the method we want to call. So in my case, this is ball group and stop, how do I call it? Stop ball, stop ball. So I think this entire part kind of makes sense. We are calling a group and we have the name of the group and the method we want to call inside of this group. So why do we need get tree? And this I can actually illustrate. So let me run the game right now and let's hope it doesn't crash. Yeah, okay, so the ball actually stops in the middle, so we know it's working. But while the game is running, if you look to our scene tree, you can right now see local and remote. And you can click on this still while the game is running and it shows our game and all the nodes inside of our game in real time. So you can see all the nodes inside of the game while the game is running. And here you can see a root node and only then our level node. And this entire thing is our scene tree for the entire game. And obviously it's still a fairly simple one, but what we actually want to get is this root node that we get access to the entire tree while the game is running. And this is what get tree is doing, that it gets us the entire tree and from there we can access specific functions, like calling a group, which we couldn't do just from a specific node by itself. So I hope that makes sense. But we are making progress because the ball is stopping indeed. So that's quite nice. This has to be called on both sides 
of the field. And with that, we can start talking about restarting the ball. And this works in basically the same way. So I go back to my ball and in here, I want to create another function that I'm going to call, let's call it restart ball. And in here, we could just set speed back to 600. But I don't think this would be enough. And the reason for that is quite simple. That if we were to restart the ball like this, it would still point in the same direction. So if the ball is going to the top right and then hits the end of the field, it will restart to the top right, which would get really predictable. So not only do I want to set the speed again to 600, I also want to restart the velocity and get different random values. And I can literally just copy and paste them and now would we'll get new values when I restart the ball. So quite straightforward. And now again, we have to call a group to restart this function. And if you want to challenge yourself, this should be doable if you got this far. So try this for yourself. But really, all you have to do, let me save this one again. We need to call this function in a very similar way compared to this. But I only want to do this once the timer has run out. So this has to be inside of this countdown timer. And now instead of stop ball, I want to have start ball, I think restart ball I called it. I'm terrible with naming functions. But okay, so now whenever this time has run out, we're going to call this group and call the restart ball function. So there's one more thing we need, that we have to start this timer. So whenever the ball has hit either of the fields, we want to start the timer. And once the timer has finished, we want to call this group. So we have to figure out how to start this timer. And that is actually super easy. So all we need is to first target the node of the timer, which again, you do with the dollar sign. And what you can also do is just drag and drop the node next to dollar sign. And there you would get the name of the node. This time in quotation marks, but that is the same outcome. So if you typed it with quotation marks or without, it's the same thing. They both result in the same thing that you are getting the node. And now to start the timer, all we need is start. And let me copy this to both sides. And now this should be working. So let's try. So we have the ball here and let me... And there we go, this is working. So let me lose again and wait a bit. And there we go. So the ball is restarting after about two seconds over however long it takes. So cool, seems quite all right. There's one thing we could be doing that right now we're duplicating code here quite substantially. So instead what I'm going to do is create a new function. Um, let me put it all the way at the bottom. And that is to create a new function. Let's call it score achieved. And then here, all we have to do is copy this entire line or even cut it. And then inside of each of the signals, I just want to call this. So score achieved and score achieved. So now if you want to influence either of these, we just have to work with this function and this doesn't duplicate code. So quite a bit nicer. But all right, now we have a basic timer and all we need now is to display this timer. And this is going to be another label. So I have a player score right now and an opponent score. I want to add another label. So I select the level node and add another label that I'm going to call countdown timer. All right, I already have one. Um, let's call it countdown label. That feels better. And I'm going to put it right to the other labels. And the really important part here is that all of these labels are above all of the other nodes in the scene tree, especially the ball. So I want the ball to be above the countdown label in the actual game. Otherwise, I think it would look quite a bit weird that we have text over the ball. But okay, now we have our countdown label. And for now, let me just write in here countdown and move it to the middle of the screen. So again, I click on layout, I click on full rect to select the entire viewport. 
And now I align it to the center and to the center. And now with the margin, I just move it up a tiny bit. Um, I guess here seems fine. It's fairly subjective. Whatever you feel like looks good. Could also be at the bottom, could be anywhere, whatever you fancy. And again, we have to give this a custom font to match it with the other two pieces of text we have. So I go to custom font, get to dynamic font, then get to font again. It's quite click intensive. And then drag and drop our font in there. And I'm going to make this... Um, let's go with 50. Um, yeah, I think that seems fine. And now this one got a slightly different color. So again, under custom colors, I click on font color. And this time, let me demonstrate another way to pick a color. And that is this color picker here. So if you click on this, Godot lets you just pick another color, maybe not the background. Let me use the white color here. So if you just use this, you can literally select any color on the screen. And what I want to do is I want to select the color of the ball, which right now we can't do because there's the collision shape above the ball. So I go to the ball scene and just make this invisible. And here's an important thing. Just because the shape is invisible does not mean it's not there anymore. You just can't see it. But for a collision shape, you can never see it anyway, so it doesn't matter. If you actually wanted to disable it, you would have to go to Disabled and click this on On. But just because it's invisible doesn't mean it's not there, so be aware of that. But now with this one disabled, we can actually see the color of our ball. And now I can go back to Font Color and just pick the color of the ball, which is this orange, red-ish color. And all right, this seems all right. But now we have to figure out how to display this text only if the count on timer is running and how to get the text of the count on timer. And for that, we have to go back to our code. And in here, there are two things we need to work on. Number one is that we actually displayed the time left within our count on label. And this happens in the process function because we want to continuously do this on every single frame of our game. So in here, I want to target our count on label and I want to set the text. Now, what I want for the text is how much time is left for the timer. And this we can target quite easily. All we need is the countdown timer itself. And it has an attribute called time left. So this is how much time is left after the timer has started. But there are two problems with this right now. Number one is that this is a number. So as always, we have to use the string method just like with the other labels. Oh, and let me do this properly. There we go. But there is going to be another problem. And I think if I run this code, this should demonstrate it quite well. Meaning that we have a lot of numbers after the digit, which, well, isn't great. And this is another thing with data types, that so far we have only seen integers, which is numbers without a decimal point. Numbers with a decimal point are called floating point numbers or floats in short. And while floats can be generally quite useful, in this case, we really don't want them. So we want to convert the float of our count on time at time left to an integer, which we can do really easily by using the int method, which just takes a float and turns it into an integer. So that's all we have to do in our code editor. So before our count on timer, I type int, and then I just copy and paste or cut the entire thing in there. And now if I'm running this, we can see, let me lose one, there we go. And all of this is starting again. But now, right now, it starts at one and goes to zero, and this seems quite weird. So I'm going to add one to this. So just plus one, and now two, one, and then we start. And yeah, I think that seems okay. So there's one more thing we need to do, that now, when the timer is not running or when the timer has finished, we want to hide this text because we don't need it anymore. And this we can also do really easily. So once the timer has run out, I want to target the node again. So count on timer. And I want to target the visibility, which you can see down here. And there's visible and you can switch it on and off. So I can go visible and this is going to be false. 
false. And here again, this is directly using a boolean. So far, whenever we used an if statement, we implicitly used a boolean. So let me go with this one here. If this value existed, this line would be true. But we can use boolean values immediately. So you can use false and true in cases like this. So if something is on, it's true. If something is off, it's false. And what I want to do for our timer is then when the timer is running out, we want to set this to false. However, when we are scoring a goal, I want to set this to be true again. So once the score is achieved, I also want to set the countdown timer dot visible is equal to true. And then by default, I want this to be off. So we can't see it when the scene is starting. And let's try all of this. So we are in a game again. We can't see it by default and let me lose. And the game crashes. And the game crashes for a very simple reason. Targeting the countdown timer, but I need to target the countdown label. And the countdown timer is always invisible. So this one wouldn't make sense. So countdown label, and now this should be working. So now let's try off this again. And two, one, and go. And there we go. We have our countdown label. So seems quite good. Now we are basically done with the entire game and we already have the really basic setup. All that's really left to do is a couple of fine tuning things and adding the sound. And that's gonna be coming in the next part. So adding the sounds is a really simple thing to do. We just have to add a couple of notes and then it's basically done. It's as easy as that. But besides that, we have to add another thing. And this is something you have seen earlier a tiny bit, that because we are moving with physics, it can happen if the ball hits a pedal at a certain angle that the pedal is moving, which I want to avoid. And my fix for this is gonna be the simplest one I can think of. And all I'm really going to do is to reset the paddles on each side every time a score is being achieved. So if a paddle is being moved to the side during the game, it is going to be reset once the game restarts. And that is just a couple of lines of code, nothing fancy. So let's start with the sound. That's the much easier part. And let's actually jump right in. So here we're back in our level scene. And what I want to add is a couple of sounds. I want to add a sound to the ball that if the ball hits either of the pedal or with either of the walls, then I want to play one sound. And if a score is being achieved, then I want to play another sound. So let's start with the sound of achieving a score. So with our level selected, I'm going to add another note. And the note we need is called an audio stream player. And when you type just audio stream, audio stream player, you can see we have an audio stream player, an audio stream player 2D, and an audio stream player 3D. And now you might be wondering, why do we need spatial awareness for our sound? And the answer is quite simple. Think of if you have a 3D scene, you might have sound behind a wall or really far away. And if that's the case, you want the sound to be less loud. Same for 2D, if the sound is really far away, you want it to be less loud. Whereas for audio stream player, this one doesn't care about space, it will always have the same volume. So this is what we need. So I click on create, and I want this to be score, let's call it score sound. And in our asset folder, we have a couple of sounds. We have 8-bit beep and 8-bit blob. Let me drag this up a bit. So beep and blob. The score sound had the plop sound, so all I have to do is to drag and drop this file into the stream. And here you can preview this thing, you have playing and autoplay. Playing means it is literally playing all the time. Autoplay means it's starting when the game is starting. So if you want to click on play, you can hear the sound right now. And let me click on it. And you should be able to hear a very long and monotonous sound, which well is not intended. And what is happening here is that Godot is repeating the sound all the time, whereas we only want to play it once. And this we can achieve very easily. All we have to do is to go to the import setting next to our scene tree, something we haven't seen so far actually. But in here you can set specific variables on how something is being imported. And for OGG files, that's a sound format, you can click on loop. So is this file being imported as a loop or just as one specific sound? And I want this to be one specific sound. So I deselect loop and click on re-import. And now we have only one sound. So if I click on playing, you can hear it only for 
a very brief period of time. So exactly what we want. And while we're at it, I also want to do the same thing for the other sound, just so we have it all ready. And now we have our sound. All we have to do now is to play this whenever we achieve a score. So for that, I am going back to my code by pressing F3. And here we already have a score achieved function. So all we have to do in here is target our score sound. And we just want it to play. So then it's going to play the sound once. And let's try this. And yeah, I hope you can hear it. It's quite short, but it's definitely there. Cool. So now we have a score sound. The one thing left is we need to do the same thing for our ball. So I open the ball script. And in here, what I want to do is whenever we have a collision, I want to play the plop sound or the beep sound, this one. And we actually already have that. So we know if this one is true, we have a collision. So in here, we could execute the function for this. But obviously, we first need a node. So let me open the entire ball scene again. And in here, I'm going to add another node that is also going to be an audio stream player. And this one is going to be collision sound. And now I want to add the beep sound. And let me preview it. And yeah, sounds like a collision. And it only plays once. So now in here, we can just play it. So collision sound dot play. And now let me run the entire game by pressing F5. And yeah, this looks good. Um, You might want to work on the sound design a bit, but those I think are fine for a test game. Okay, and we are almost done. The one thing left to do is now a level scene. Let me open it. Is that whenever a score is being achieved, I want to reset both of the players with a certain distance to their respective side. And for this, let me open the code. We just have to work in this function and set the X position of each of the players. So I want to target um, my player, the position of the player, and then the X position of the player. And in here, let me put it at 35. So it's 35 pixels from the left side of the screen. And now the same for the opponent, dot position dot x. And we know our entire screen is 1280 pixels wide. And from that, I want to subtract 35 pixels. And that is really all we need to do. So let me run the code now. And this is probably going to be a bit difficult to see. You can see it very slowly. But this would, if we have any kind of physics mistake, this is going to fix it quite drastically. So with that, we have a finished game.